All right. So I'll do a quick introduction and then we'll get started. Okay. okay. Do you want to get a coffee before or anything? Yep, want water good. in front of you? Okay, good. Yep, All okay. right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. This is the first of four series webinars with Dr. Mark Jabin, MD. And Mark comes to us from um, doing a lot of work in New Zealand and lean and then coming to North America. And he's an emergency room doctor, so that's wonderful. I can't do him enough service, so I'm going to get him to do his background. But let me tell you a little bit about the webinar and what we're trying to accomplish. This webinar is one of four where we're putting a book together. We'd like everybody's help, and you get access to the ebook as it's being developed, and we'll do a final copy in about three to four months. We're going to use ideas, suggestions, and we're going to even change the title based on what people suggest in our online office. And if you take a look at chat, you'll see it is at leanleadership.webex.com. So please join, sorry, leanleadership.guru slash community.html. So please join, it's free. And you'll find this webinar recorded in there as well as the book. So Dr. Mark Jabin, welcome. Uh, please go ahead, introduce yourself and give everybody a little idea of the background. And if I missed anything, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, thanks George. And um, hello to everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank each of you so much for being here. There are people from literally all over the world, and I thank you deeply for your participation. So you might wonder what a guy like me is doing in a place like this. Um, as an emergency physician, uh, I've spent my time mostly in the pit, so to speak, on the front line. But as any of you know, in most organizations, particularly smaller ones, you don't just wear one hat. Uh, and there have been more than enough opportunities for me to be the manager and leader's role with colleagues and certainly with patients and healthcare to be part of change. And as I suspect, uh, your opportunities have demonstrated that for you as well, and how we all struggle with change. My own experiences um, drove me to better try to understand that, ultimately arriving here uh, with insights that we'll share uh, over these few webinars. So they're insights that hopefully will help you be better at change too, whether you're a participant in a change effort, leading that effort, or coaching and guiding others in their efforts. You know, it's easiest to see change, or lack thereof, at the level of our organizations, our departments, our work groups, and teams. But really, this isn't where change is actually happening. The real change we create occurs at a more fundamental level, the interactions of one person with another. So it's at this level that I'd like to share with you over these webinars, insights from the brain research, because they bring us yet another level of understanding, a deeper level as to what can make us effective at change and help us see why our efforts fall short. What we're gonna do is review the current research and clear up some conventional beliefs about how our brain feels about change. The first of which is actually the title of this series, How the Brain Reacts to Change. You know, that's not exactly right. You see, the brain doesn't react to change. It reacts to changes. Changing is, after all, how the brain works and it's its, it's secret to success. It is doing this constantly. What the brain fights is a change it believes is less likely to lead to success than what it's currently doing. Your brain might fight the noun, a change, but making this judgment, as in whether to change, the verb, is exactly what our brain does moment by moment it feels best about. So we could have entitled this series, Why the Brain Loves to Change, but that has less impact. It doesn't feel so immediate. We'll see why we need our brain to see the world half full, yet it operates instead by seeing it half empty. Now that's not necessarily bad because the features that block change are the very features that protect us from making a bad choice. So it's not so much that people resist change. What they want to avoid is a change that makes it worse, makes it harder to be successful, and from their brain's perspective, less likely to survive. What we are after is improvement, changes that leave us better off. Innovation and creativity, you know, everybody talks about it, everybody wants it, everyone thinks they know how to get it, yet everyone struggles with actually achieving it. But if we understand how our brain is operating, we'll see how creativity actually happens and why the conventional beliefs around innovation often fall short. The real challenge is this translation between the glass half empty and the glass half full. The secret of what Toyota and Lean have taught us and what the brain research is showing us. You know, Lean has been about implementing tools to get improvement and we know these actions work, but beneath the act there lies a foundation, a substructure of belief and intent that forms the act. You know, if you're able to participate in Jake Abraham's webinars on Toyota business practice, the first layer is the Toyota way. But before applying that, he listed several mindsets, intentions that had to be present for the business practices to be effective. 
And often, this is where the struggle begins. So what I want to address is what gets in the way of these behaviors. Why don't we already do this? Why is it hard to get yourself to do this? Why is it hard to get others to do this? <clears throat> what should our behavior be to overcome the, these obstacles? I hope to build upon the recent webinars by Jeff Liker and Michael Vallet here on the LLI site. But not to worry if you weren't part of those, you have more than enough experience to make the connections yourself. For those of you well-versed in Lean, I hope you'll see some deeper connections to what the developers of TPS and those who continue to evolve, evolve Lean have really elucidated for us. Namely, how people can work and work together to achieve an organizational goal, while also enabling people to be successful in their ind individual jobs. So in these webinars, we'll follow Jeff Likewer's sequence for developing leaders. And we'll use the ballet's diagram from lead with respect to examine our brain's perspective on what we can do. We'll investigate two things in particular that stood out to me from Michael Ballet's webinars. First was a question that someone asked, which is, what do you do with leaders who don't want to participate? And the second is a comment from Michael that drew silence, which is, Kaizen is the path to innovation. And that was interesting to me as well. And we'll cover both of these over the course of these webinars. So I hope you'll join along with your colleagues for this entire journey, because whether you are a participant or a leader or coaching others as they navigate their path, these insights will help you tackle the challenges in this struggle over change and help you be better, whatever your role is. So I look forward to sharing this with you and hope that I can present this in a way that fascinates you as much as it fascinates me. So first, it is easier to act your way to a new way of thinking, meaning that we learn by doing, and that doing informs the way we think about something. If we see it for ourselves, if we have a context to apply it to our own world, then we can change what we're thinking about. It is easier to act your way to a new way of thinking. But first, the person has to act. Jeff Liker tells us it starts with self-development, but that requires the person to see the value of that self-development. From your brain's perspective, self-development means coming to grips with an inconvenient truth. But this happens to be an inconvenient truth that forms the basic premise each of us needs in order to navigate change. And it's encapsulated in these quotes, the first from Taichi Ono, who is credited with much of the evolution of TPS. You know, this doesn't just apply to manufacturing. You could substitute almost anything for the office, the way you manage an account, for healthcare, the way you take care of patients, for government, the way you process a permit, for construction, the way you sequence subcontractors, and for your organization, the way you change. The inconvenient truth is this. Whatever you think, whatever you believe to be true, you're likely wrong. So the basic premise is that your story is likely missing something. And for the best chance of success, you must be open to challenging that story. For the best chance of success, and for each of us working together, we must be open to the possibility that our story may not be right. Now pause for a moment and let that sink in. Hard to believe, I know, but let me show you why this is so. So in the 1950s, split brain surgery was done on patients who had uncontrollable seizures. And I'll spare you the gory details about how they inserted a knife to sever the corpus callosum, which are the connections between each half of the brain. But what you should know is that it didn't work very well for seizures, but it did enable researchers to study what each half of the brain does. It's how we learn, for instance, that, cross, that vision is a cross function. Everything you see off to the left is actually processed in your right brain and vice versa. In one such study, the researcher put a picture of a chicken claw in the patient's right visual field. A series of pictures were then shown in the other visual field. And because the halves of the brain are no longer connected, the person's brain could not directly interpret those pictures together. When asked to pick out the most appropriate picture, the person chooses a shovel. And when asked why they selected the shovel, the person responded, well, I have a chicken coop full of chicken poop, and I need a shovel to clean it out. Now, there was no mention of a chicken coop and no mention of chicken poop. The person made up a story that was plausible. 
perfectly reasonable given the facts in front of them. The only problem was it just wasn't real. What's also fascinating is that when challenged about that story, the person stuck to it like it was a statement of fact, as if it were the truth. You ever watch the Wheel of Fortune? Contestants are trying to identify a phrase. The game starts with blank letters. Letter by letter gets added. And at some point, a contestant sees enough to put it together, usually before all the letters are present. They shout out the phrase and they win. But often the contestant calls out and is wrong. Their guess looked plausible, it just wasn't right. So all this adds up to a really scary proposition. You cannot trust that the way it appears is actually the way it is. You can't trust that your story accur accurately portrays what's really going on. Your brain is not interested in gathering all the information it can get. Rather, your brain gathers just enough to concoct a story it can act upon, and then it fills in the missing pieces. The problem is, it may not be exactly correct. And when we act upon this story, we can be misled into a choice that may not be the best one available. And because you must have confidence that you can act upon that story, especially in the face of an immediate threat, we have to believe in it. And this leads each of us to think we are better than we actually are. So how does your brain actually do this? The brain has just one main criteria for success, and that is survival. In the near term, this means responding to the immediate threat in front of you. And in the longer term, having enough energy to persevere. The brain has devised a very ingenious three-tiered system to spend the least amount of energy possible to get the job done. So although we are rational creatures, capable of gather, analyze, and act on data, that's not how we make the overwhelming majority of our decisions. Our brain looks first to the hidden brain, which uses patterns of recognition and response to quickly act and respond. We have no idea what goes on there, but there is some insight by looking at our habits. The brain recognizes a cue, applies a prearranged response, and then if successful, provides a reward to encourage more of the same. That's what dopamine is about. That's what your brain uses to transmit that reward. What's often puzzling is what the brain connects as its cue, response, and reward. It often makes no sense. So if you know somebody who has panic attacks, for instance, for no apparent reason, some unclear stimulus leads to an outpouring of autonomic excess and all the symptoms that they get. There's no apparent connection. Nevertheless, this hidden brain is actually very effective, probably because it factors in our values, preferences, and beliefs, and what we are most concerned about at the moment. It gives us the big picture. And it does a really great job, one you can really trust, except it struggles for a new and novel situation, one in which there is no pre-existing pattern. Trying to force a pattern or a response onto a situation that doesn't exactly match is a recipe for mistake and error. That then, becomes the role of the prefrontal cortex, which is to monitor those hidden brain choices. And though, although we are aware of some of this oversight, much of it occurs outside of our awareness too. The prefrontal cortex is capable of a great focus on, on a particular issue, but it has a limited capacity. Researchers believe that the working memory can only handle four to nine variables at a time, and it can only process one instance at a time, which is why multitasking is really a myth and why interruptions wreak such havoc on your ability to stay on task. The prefrontal cortex is easily overwhelmed. And if so, it can't do its crucial job, putting us at risk for a poor decision. Your prefrontal cortex is the constraint of the system, its most fragile portion, and yet the one we rely on the most. You know, much of the current discussion about work-life balance is couched in terms of one generation working hard and another not wanting to work very much, but it's missing a crucial point. Because in a world where processing information is a 24 hour a day possibility, what we really are doing is overloading a limited prefrontal cortex. And as we'll see, this makes it really difficult to respond to issues when there's no clear cut answer, when that problem calls for a creative solution. So to be at our best, what we all need is a pause, a break in the action, so to speak, to give ourselves the best opportunity to be, be the most effective. And we can't do that when we are tied to our smartphones 24 hours a day and constantly thinking about work. So when there's no good option, only then is the brain willing to expend the energy to be creative, making new connections. How do we know this? Researchers put professional jazz musicians in a functional MRI with a keyboard and asked them to play a piece of music. 
The functional MRI showed a particular area of the prefrontal cortex was active. Then they took the music away and asked the musicians to improvise. Now, that area of the prefrontal cortex was turned off and a different area lit up as active. And there's a great YouTube video you can see of this. What this suggests is that if certain areas of our prefrontal cortex are occupied, we won't be creative. We can't be creative. If we're working on options, priorities, and explanations that everyone has brought to the table, our brain is not yet willing to expend the energy to seek out and make new connections. Only once you've exhausted all the possibilities, only then will you be in a frame of mind to be innovative. So we all know creativity, we all think of it as a big breakthrough made by some genius, but actually creativity means more than just this. In our daily work, when we apply our knowledge and skills and experience to recognize the circumstances that don't seem to fit, and then mix and match the various options that are available to come up with just the way to respond, that's the sort of creativity that brings joy to people in their work. We'll learn more about that in the third session. So your prefrontal cortex weighs the evidence to decide on what path is more likely to lead to success. It uses the circumstances that you observe through your senses and applies its sorting criteria. These are what's the most concerning at the, at the moment, the biggest threat in front of it, and the measure of success, the way success is being measured. It uses these to make a choice. Either defend the Hidden Brain's proposal as the cho best choice for success and then resist any other suggestions, or challenge it, seek a new option, another possible path that will likely be more successful. And it's doing this moment by moment. This this is uh, very interesting. Can we can we stop here? Yeah, yeah. For, for a couple of questions. If anyone has sure. questions, put them in chat. I've got a few. Um, so I I heard Jeff Liker in the past say that almost the same thing you said, which is if we're if we're kind of running out of options, the fast and slow thinking was in place, and if we can do some slow thinking, although it's painful at first. Um, it it leads to us looking at the facts, which which we lay out in numbers or, or what have you, you know, just general data, and it forces us to think outside of the doing things normally as usual. It forces us to be creative about a new solution, possibly. So this is almost the same thing. It is management, and this is where he was coming from. Is management if we present facts in such a way and challenge. Uh, people to think through them, it kind of puts them in a, a mode called, um, yeah, of course, survival mode and, and which option is the best and it chooses. And then they have the capacity to be creative. Can you connect those thoughts for me? I mean, I'm trying to say something. How does that work? Yeah, it, and it's, it, this is not something that you can really turn on and turn off. In other words, you can't just turn on creativity and turn it off. Uh, in the fast so thinking paradigm from Kahneman is a little bit different than what I'm saying, which is that it's not either or. Both of those functions are going on at the same time. They're interacting together, uh, the, the slow and the fast. Um, and there, and between those two, they're reaching a decision, a decision which you find out uh, through your emotions and feelings and your gut reactions. And, those, and that is whether what's on the table is going to make you more successful or less successful. As a manager or leader, the real challenge is that you can't make people do one or the other. You can't get them to do with the other. They have to get there on their own. And so what we have to do is create the environment that encourages, allows, enables people to think through, uh, work through all the possibilities, uh, because there may be one of those possibilities that will work just fine. But if not, only then will your brain spend the energy to be creative, because again, it's trying to conserve energy. No reason to go there if it doesn't have to. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Okay, so two more quick questions. Sure. The gut. When you say it's a gut feel, now the gut has a direct path to your brain. Is that not true? Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, it, it does. But uh, what really is happening is that um, you know, there's this concept of the emotional brain. Uh, and that you know, if we could just sort of get past the emotional brain, then actually we can really get some work done. But the, the reality is that your emotions don't drive your response. The emotional brain is really sort of a misnomer. Um, 
your emotions, your feelings, your intuitions, your hunches, all that gut stuff is just the mechanism your brain is using to communicate the decision it has made to your awareness. So when we have those sorts of sensations, um, that's just the output. That's just telling us what's going on. It's actually a really efficient system. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, and one one more. There was um, a thing I used to use, and I referred, uh, you know, I, I made a reference to the right author, but they, they suggested that there's a lot going on in the brain like you're suggesting, but if you were to narrow it down, you would put it into, like, the brain has four quadrants. Uh, and, you know, here's an analogy. Help me understand whether this is kind of correct. It's an A, B, C, D quadrant. A is to acquire knowledge. B is to bond with individuals. C is to be creative. And D is to defend your point. And the interesting thing he said was A, B, and C can work together nicely. But as soon as D gets kicked in, A, B, and C shut down as drives. Like on a computer, as soon as you're defending yourself, A, B, and C are shut down. Now, does that make sense? It sure does. And we're going to really talk about that a bit more in session two, George, because it turns out that, again, D drive defending is really the choice that the brain has made that that's a more likely path to success than the ABC drive. So really the challenge becomes uh, how do we how do we help folks? How do we ourselves move past that to be able to move on? And that, again, we'll, we'll talk about more in the session, two. And we'll really get into it in session three where we talk about um, Kaizen and creativity and innovation and practice. Great. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple questions. Uh, Peter, sure. do you want to ask them? I don't see uh, questions in the chat, George. Okay, very good then. Um, let's let's go, Mark. That's great. All right. All right. So what we need um, to really be effective is we need hidden brain that has good patterns and effective habits, or we'd never be able to keep up with all that's coming at us. Because remember, your hidden brain is very quick about coming to judgments and acting. We need a prefrontal cortex that's well-rested, well-fed, well-watered, and uncluttered to protect us from getting off on an unproductive tangent. And we need creativity we can count on when there's no apparent path to success. Then we can take advantage of what researchers call neuroplasticity, which is the ability of the brain through practice to reinforce new connections and prune away the old. So it turns out you really can't teach an old dog new tricks if the dog sees the benefit. So our brain gathers just enough information to get a view of the circumstances and then applies its sorting criteria, which is made up of the most pressing concerns about the apparent risks to concoct a story that makes sense of the situation and choose a course of action. The problem is that without a full accounting of those circumstances and without factoring the full array of risks, this story does not necessarily represent what's really happening. And the resulting choice may well not be the best one possible. So the key is being willing to challenge your explanations and challenge your story. So that information could come from two places. It could come from you or from others. The challenge, if it's from you, is that you cannot be an objective judge of your own performance. Remember, your interpretation, your story is not fully correct. That's why professional athletes, individuals skilled at their craft, have a coach so they can get better and improve. If it's for the other person, well, what happens when you put two people together? Each will have their story, and you can bet those stories will differ. The result is conflict. Different views, different sorting criteria, different stories. And what you observe is resistance. So the key to getting it right, the key to learning what's missing from your story is their story, to be sure you have a full accounting of the current condition and to be sure you're factoring in the full array of risks, not just your own. And to do that, you have to know their stories. So conflict is not something to dread. It's not the result of doing something wrong. It's what we should expect. And it is exactly what you need to get your story right. 
So that then is the essential role of the respect for people principle. Because the practical application of respect lies in how I deal with your resistance. Resistance is the tool, it's the feedback you need that tells you that your story is missing something. And without respect, you have little chance to get it right. So from the brain's perspective, self-development self means incorporating this basic premise into your worldview. Your story may or may not be fully correct. So next session, George, um, we're going to delve into what respect really means, what it takes from the brain's perspective. We're going to get into why others have a hard time according to the basic premise and, we're gonna, and why sharing stories is not as easy as it should be for you or for them. Um, yet, the key to coaching and supporting others, as we'll learn, is in doing that. There is actually a really good reason why they just don't get it. And what we'll see are there are some pesky brain operating features that explain all this. Um, and, but there's some countermeasures, too, that we can take. So for everyone out there, here's your homework till next session. Take advantage of your neuroplasticity and practice this. One question to ask yourself. And then two questions to ask the other person. I hope you'll take the chance to do this. Maybe the next encounter you have with somebody later today. See what happens and let us know because this is the sort of stuff we want to incorporate in our book. And this is the sort of stuff we want to use to help further our discussion as we move through these, through these webinars. George?